very important because, uh, after all, anemia is one of the uh, major indicators that the patient might uh, or the person might have iron deficiency. Uh, now, hopefully, I can get my slides to advance. No, it doesn't want to. They were doing fine before. Uh, what's... Oh, there we go. These are my uh, disclaimers. Uh, so, first of all, to talk a little bit about uh, anemia, uh, and I understand that there's a particular interest in uh, this symposium on uh, uh, differences between men and women when it comes to health. Uh, according to the World Health Organization, uh, anemia is defined as a hemoglobin less than 13 grams per deciliter in men and less than 12 grams per deciliter in women. Now, what I'm showing on the graph here is the cumulative prevalence of heart failure uh, in patients with uh, chronic uh, outpatients with heart failure. Uh, so the zero line is the WHO definition. So we've normalized this for men and women. And you can see that if you have heart failure, you have a, a high risk of, of having anemia. It doesn't matter very much whether it's HEF-REF or HEF-PEF that round about 35% uh, of patients in this particular large cohort uh, of patients uh, will have anemia. But is the WHO definition correct? I think that's the first question we must ask. If you look at healthy adult men and healthy adult women, you can see that the uh, normal haemoglobin is substantially higher. And we have evidence that the risk of uh, haemoglobin as a risk factor in heart failure, it, the risk starts to climb uh, m more when you're at these levels, when you drop below these levels, rather than the WHO definition. The WHO definition is already... And there are good arguments uh, that we should actually increase uh, the definition, uh, the threshold definition of anemia by about a gram, uh, which would mean that half or more than half of our patients with uh, heart failure have anemia. And you can see down here uh, that the relationship uh, between age and sex, that the, uh, the risk of anemia rises with age. So men and in women, but perhaps more steeply in men than in women. So that's uh, an anemia in a nutshell. Now we have to move on to think about iron deficiency. And the problem is that we don't actually have a very good definition of iron deficiency. In black, you can see the current guideline criteria for iron deficiency, which were an arbitrary set of rules set up to, in the design of clinical trials. It doesn't really have uh, great um, uh, intellectual credibility behind it, but those are the ones that, that are currently in the guideline. And you can see that for patients with heart failure, particularly for women uh, with heart failure, an awful lot of patients, uh, up to 80% of patients uh, with heart failure will fulfill uh, the theory. And you might then say, well, why bother uh, trying to detect whether somebody has iron deficiency in, uh, in, and heart failure? If so many people are affected, why don't we just uh, 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 treat everybody? And I think that, that actually is quite an interesting argument. There are a few people who have uh, heart failure due to iron overload, and obviously we wouldn't want to give those patients uh, iron. But um, if iron deficiency is very common, then perhaps we should be treating many of these patients. The problem with uh, the guideline, uh, current guideline definition of iron deficiency is that it includes ferritin. And ferritin is a problem because ferritin is an inflammatory marker, probably more important an inflammatory marker in heart failure rather than a marker of iron deficiency. And if we actually use serum iron or the uh, transferrin saturation, the TSAT, 
we get more conservative definitions uh, of iron deficiency, around about 40 to 50 percent. Again, still more common in women than in men, uh, but uh, perhaps the difference is less stark. Um, this just emphasises that if we take these various definitions of iron deficiency uh, and actually combine that with anemia, then perhaps up to 80% of the heart failure population have this uh, sort of problem. But as I've said, uh, in, that, in this blue colour here, we have these patients with uh, a ferritin less than 100, which fulfills the guideline uh, criteria for iron deficiency according to the ESC. But um, we're not really sure that these patients have iron deficiency. The WHO suggests it should be a ferritin less than 15. Uh, the uh, most uh, uh, laboratories will take a value less than 30. But most people would say that a ferritin between 30 and 100 is normal. Uh, you can see that many of these patients are not anemic, as opposed to the patients with a low TSAT or a low iron, where a very large proportion of these patients have anemia. Now, this uh, quite complex slide uh, shows different levels of anemia. If you're red, that means that you're one gram per deciliter below WHO. Green means that you're one gram above. Uh, the WHO threshold for anemia. We think that the green patients are really normal, yellow are borderline, uh, orange are mildly deficient, uh, well, mildly anemic, red are really quite severely anemic. And what you would want to see if you, um, if you believe that anemia and iron deficiency are close bedfellows is a steep gradient between green and red. And you can see that for serum iron, uh, either less than eight or less than or equal to 12, you see these steep gradients. You see the steep gradients for the T-sets. Uh, if you take ferritin less than 30, you do get a bit of a gradient, but you can see for the ESC guideline, there's really no gradient at all. Notice that in this population of patients uh, who either had HEF-REF or HEF-PEF, uh, but many of them actually just suspected heart failure, but where the, uh, the diagnosis was refuted, you can still see that many of these patients uh, have iron deficiency anemia. So this is quite a widespread problem. I don't think it is just patients with heart failure, uh, um, but patients with heart failure certainly seem to be at increased risk compared to other older people in the population. Uh, this just uh, shows you a rather curious phenomenon that we think of iron deficiency as uh, a bad prognostic sign. Uh, you're at higher risk of developing anemia, you're at higher risk of death. You can see that for TSAT and for serum iron, the lower the values, uh, the higher the risk of all-cause mortality. And these are the thresholds for normal values. But in contrast with ferritin, if you have a low ferritin, you're at lower risk. What increases your risk is a high ferritin. So um, it gets rather curious. And if, if you then separate your population by the TSAT, you can see that if your TSAT is normal, it really doesn't matter what your ferritin is. Uh, it, even if it's below 30, you have uh, not much anemia uh, and you have uh, a low mortality, a hazard ratio here of 0.85. On the other hand, if you have a raised ferritin, you can see that uh, there is an increased uh, mortality. Uh, and I think this is due to inflammation, uh, as we can see here this inflammatory signal increasing ferritin. Inflammation at the same time will provoke uh, iron deficiency. Inflammation increases the secretion of hepcidin and hepcidin is a molecule uh, that stops you uh, uh, absorbing serum iron. Notice that if your TSAT is less than 20, it really doesn't uh, matter what your ferritin is. Your risk increases and the lower your TSAT, the, uh, the the lower your, uh, lower your hemoglobin. So uh, 
if there's one clear message here it is just don't measure ferritin. It's going to confuse you. It's going to lead to uncertainty. Just measure the T-set uh, or even better measure the serum iron. Notice that all of the studies of uh, giving intravenous iron have excluded people with a truly normal hemoglobin uh, above 14 or 15 grams per deciliter. Uh, those patients we find very low uh, incidence of uh, iron deficiency. When encountering somebody with anemia or iron deficiency, I think it is uh, important to take uh, a check uh, for possible causes of blood loss. And I would recommend as a very minimum uh, doing uh, a test for blood in the feces or in the urine. Uh, some people would go much further and would do a full GI investigation. I think that that is uh, it's quite demanding on our patients to have uh, full colonoscopy and duodenoscopy. So uh, I settle for uh, a compromise of just checking for GI blood loss. When thinking about iron, remember that uh, by the time you are developing anemia, you're already quite severely uh, iron deficient. Uh, the, m most of the iron is stored in the liver, uh, the bone marrow and reticular endothelial system, a large amount in the haemoglobin. But also remember that iron is important for muscles, uh, the mitochondria uh, and uh, uh, various other oxidative enzymes. The uh, dietary iron uh, is, um, well, that's where we get most of our iron. Uh, the uh, iron is absorbed. Uh, providing you don't have a block to iron absorption uh, due to uh, increased secretion of hepcidin. Uh, if the iron is absorbed, then it will be transferred with a transferrin. So that's why you need a high saturation to the transferrin. And that will distribute it to the various organs, um, uh, uh, in particular erythropoiesis. So why might people develop iron deficiency? It's possible that they have low uh, iron intake, either because you can lose your appetite if you have heart failure. It may be that you're a vegetarian and have very low uh, iron content in the diet. Uh, many of these patients will have reduced iron absorption, either to, uh, because of the, if the liver secretes more hepcidin uh, due to the inflammation it's the same signal that increases your ferritin uh, and that will block uh, iron absorption in the gut. But there's another important reason, I think, which is reduced gastric acidity. That may just be a function of old age, but also we use proton pump inhibitors and H2 antagonists widely. And there's plenty of evidence to show that these will exacerbate uh, iron deficiency. It's also likely that there are increased iron losses. Many of our patients are on aspirin or anticoagulants. Uh, many will have gut pathology. The most common gut pathology when you do investigate them is uh, they have duodenitis or inflammation. And uh, for those poor patients in hospital who are very sick, then uh, perhaps just the amount of blood drawn with phlebotomy can be, become important. And then we have functional iron deficiency. This is trapping of iron in the liver and the ret reticular endothelial system. So it's not available uh, for normal functions. And again, this is evident. This is caused by inflammation. That rise in hepcidin locks uh, iron inside cells uh, where uh, they can't be used for uh, producing uh, red blood cells. <clears throat> So uh, what are the consequences of iron deficiency? Well, first of all, you get a fall in hemoglobin. Um, you might also get a fall in myoglobin, and that will affect oxygen utilization. Of course, if you're anemic, the heart tries to compensate for that by increasing stroke volume and cardiac output to try and maintain oxygen delivery to the periphery. So a low hemoglobin will put an extra stress on the heart. At the same time, uh, there may be defective oxygen utilization, so aerobic enzymes, uh, mitochondrial function may all be impaired in the presence of uh, um, iron deficiency. 
So that takes us through the, uh, the background to iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia. Uh, so what have we done about it? Uh, well, there are now uh, uh, a substantial suite of clinical trials, uh, either with ferric carboxymaltose or more re recently with uh, ferric derisimaltose. I'm going to talk mainly about the Ironman, but I should mention some other studies uh, to begin with. <coughs> um, and um, uh, in particular, the FAIR HF and the CONFIRM HF studies. These studies uh, gave intravenous iron for 6 to 12 months to patients with heart failure and demonstrated improvement in symptoms, improvement in exercise capacity uh, and improvement in quality of life. So they demonstrated that patients felt better and uh, also that the uh, there would be a rise in haemoglobin. Haemoglobin rose by between half and one gram per deciliter, often not normalizing with intravenous iron. So there seemed to be more to anemia and heart failure than just iron deficiency, but it certainly made an important contribution. I'm also going to talk uh, about the Affirm AHF study uh, and the Ironman study, which are the two big outcome studies have recently reported. Just before I do that, uh, I'd again like to reinforce this idea that ferritin is a pretty useless uh, marker when it comes to iron deficiency in heart failure. And you can see in the trials like uh, FairHF and CONFIRMHF that the uh, serum ferritin really did not predict the benefit of giving intravenous iron. And in fact, if anything, it was the people with the more normal serum ferritin who got the most benefit from uh, ferric carboxymaltose. On the other hand, you can see with the TSAT that if your TSAT was over 20, there was no evidence of benefit from intravenous iron. All the benefit was in the TSATs less than 20. <clears throat> so this is the AFFIRM HF study, the first large outcome study of intravenous iron. They randomized about a thousand patients uh, with the uh, guideline criteria for iron deficiency, which I've said are problematic and will have, I think, included many patients who genuinely didn't have uh, uh, genuine iron deficiency. Uh, the primary composite outcome was uh, heart failure hospitalizations and cardiovascular death up to 52 weeks, uh, and patients were randomized one to one. The study was only uh, the follow-up was only over 52 weeks. Uh, patients could get uh, up to four doses of ferric carboxymaltose, one prior to hospital discharge and three post-discharge uh, doses. Mm. I've got to stick on my slides again. I'm not uh, advancing. Um, here we go. Thank you. Um, so this is the primary outcome of the Affirm AHF trial, um, recurrent heart failure hospitalizations and cardiovascular death. You can see it came close to statistical significance. Uh, P equals 0.059, a 21% reduction uh, in the primary endpoint. There was also an improvement in uh, the uh, Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire uh, which is a health status quality of life type tool. So the patients felt better and did somewhat better. We should notice that the um, firm HF study was affected by the COVID pandemic. And when you do an analysis adjusted for the COVID pandemic, uh, the clinical trial was statistically significant. So I think most people believe that this is a genuine result, uh, a little bit of uncertainty. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, uh, almost certainly true. We subsequently did a meta-analysis um, to put all of the trials before the Affirm AHF uh, together. Uh, and as you can see, this uh, strongly suggested a reduction in hospitalization or cardiovascular mortality. This is a first event analysis, so but quite strongly positive. On the other hand, no reduction in cardiovascular mortality uh, so far. The, uh, the hazard ratio 0.89, so perhaps an 11% reduction 
uh, in mortality. But notice the confidence intervals are quite wide. And so we can't exclude a 30% reduction in mortality, which would be very useful. And we also can't exclude a 20% increase in mortality, which would be a little bit worrying. So uh, we need more uh, clinical trial to uh, get a conclusive result. These are the current 2021 uh, guidelines from the European Society of Cardiology. Um, they recommend uh, that you do a number of tests for looking for iron deficiency. I would strongly recommend uh, uh, thinking about doing TSAT alone. They do emphasize the TSAT less than 20% to alleviate symptoms, improve exercise capacity and quality of life. And now for patients uh, who are hospitalized with heart failure uh, to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization. The guidelines, uh, as currently stated, specify it should be ferric carboxymaltose. Um, and now we need to look at the Ironman trial. So um, there are a number of remaining questions for Ironman. Uh, the trial I'm going to talk about in a moment. Uh, are the benefits of intravenous iron generic or are they specific to ferric carboxymaltose? Are the two agents similarly safe? Is administration of iron effective in the non-acute setting? Uh, should the TSAT be the preferred diagnostic test for iron deficiency? Uh, is there longer term beyond 12 months uh, on the evidence on the efficacy and safety of intravenous iron? And does intravenous iron indeed reduce mortality? And that takes us to the Ironman trial. This was uh, funded by the British Heart Foundation uh, with support from Pharma Cosmos, who provided the ferric derizimaltose, an alternative intravenous agent uh, to uh, ferric carboxymaltose. So this was an investigator-led uh, British Heart Foundation funded clinical trial. These are the inclusion criteria, so the patients had to have a somewhat reduced ejection fraction, they had to be um, symptomatic heart failure, TSAT less than 20 or ferritin less than 100, so not so different from the ESC guideline criteria and of concern to me, I think uh, patients, some patients in this study wouldn't have iron deficiency in my opinion, but uh, we'll see how that uh, pans out in a moment. Um, they had to have an increased risk of cardiovascular events, either because of a current or recent hospitalization or an elevated anteproBNP. BNP. Most people were actually um, enrolled as outpatients uh, with an elevated anteproBNP. BNP. Uh, and you can see a number of exclusion criteria down the right hand side. Uh, this is the design of the study. Uh, so a one-to-one -one randomization, uh, just over 1,100 patients. Uh, patients could get uh, dosed with ferric carboxymaltose basically every uh, four months during the study. If their TSAT was less than 25% or ferritin less than 100, notice that the TSAT is now 25% rather than 20%. So uh, being a little bit more uh, aggressive about uh, <clears throat> uh, keeping patients topped up with intravenous iron. Um, and uh, quite large doses of intravenous iron can be given with this agent. Uh, double the dose uh, actually uh, can be given with this agent compared to uh, uh, ferric carboxymaltose uh, with the heavier patients at least. Um, and that gives a greater chance of a single dose of intravenous iron uh, providing full iron repletion, which is uh, less likely with the ferric carboxymaltose. These are the patients, so the average age uh, in the mid-70s, uh, as in many studies with heart failure and a reduced ejection fraction was predominantly men. Uh, as I've said, most of the patients were outpatients recruited because they had symptomatic heart failure and a raised NT pro BNP. Majority of patients were in NYHA class two. <clears throat> Slight majority had ischemic heart disease, quite low ejection fractions, quite low hemoglobin, very low uh, TSAT, you can see down at 15%, uh, quite low ferritins as well. Uh, and as many of these patients have uh, mild to moderate uh, uh, um, chronic kidney disease. 
So this shows you the study uh, attendance. Uh, remember, the study was badly affected uh, by COVID, so which meant that many uh, follow-up visits had to be conducted remotely, and it was quite difficult at times to have the uh, blood test to check that the patient was fully iron replete. So it's likely that we uh, underdosed with intravenous iron in this study <clears throat> because of the COVID pandemic. You can see the distribution in light blue of the repeat dosing with uh, um, ferric derisimaltose. And at each of these four month intervals, you can see it's around about 10% of the patients. So maybe about a third of patients every year needing a top up dose of intravenous iron. It was an open label study uh, and there was some crossover. You can see that at some point, uh, almost 20% of patients in the control group receive some intravenous iron and that will have uh, diluted the uh, impact of uh, intravenous iron. Uh, I mentioned that uh, correction of iron deficiency would uh, improve uh, hemoglobin and here you can see that uh, the ferric uh, derisimaltose uh, increased uh, hemoglobin by about a gram per deciliter. You'll notice in the control group that the hemoglobin rises over time. There are several reasons for this. First of all, uh, improved medical treatment, I think, can uh, slowly correct uh, iron deficiency. And we can see that we, as we've got better control of heart failure, the iron deficiency is, may also improve. But it's a very slow process, as you can see, that can take more than a year. Uh, the other reason for the rise in hemoglobin is that patients with a low hemoglobin are, have a higher mortality. So you're selectively eliminating the people with the low hemoglobin uh, from the control group here. This was a primary endpoint, and as you can see, rather similar to the, uh, the AFFIRM AHF trial, uh, the uh, clinical trial narrowly missed its primary endpoint with a risk ratio of 0.82 and a p-value of 0.07. Um, if you <clears throat> then turn to the right, uh, this is the, uh, um, the uh, pre-specified uh, sensitivity analysis for COVID. Uh, and if you do that, uh, adjust for the effects of COVID there's a 24% reduction in the primary endpoint, which achieves statistical significance. And we were also asked when we published uh, the paper in The Lancet um, uh, to do a number of other post hoc uh, analysis. Uh, and all of these uh, analysis um, were uh, positive uh, for the clinical trial. If we compare a firm AHF, uh, this is the uh, the one-year analysis uh, adjusted for uh, COVID. Uh, this is the uh, Ironman, uh, and this is the Ironman restricted to the first year. You can see that the results of these studies look very similar. Uh, an important impact on a recurrent heart failure hospitalization. But interestingly, once you start to uh, look at the outpatient population, the more stable population, beginning to see some interesting trends in cardiovascular death in, this, uh, in the first year uh, after a randomization, a 33% reduction in cardiovascular mortality and getting close to statistical significance. If we look at the primary endpoint in terms of subgroups, you can see that men and women uh, benefited similarly that really all the benefit was in the people with a TSAT less than 20%. There was little evidence of a benefit uh, in those patients uh, who qualified on the, uh, the basis of the ferritin. Um, and perhaps more benefit in ischemic heart disease, as was observed in the AFFIRM AHF trial. If we look at the uh, severity of heart failure, as with many treatments in heart failure, start when the patient is relatively stable. The NYHA class two patients, if anything, uh, achieved a little bit more benefit. None of the, these interactions statistically significant, but the trends I think are interesting. We know that intravenous iron is good for patients with uh, anemia and chronic kidney disease, and many patients with heart failure have uh, low GFR 
the suggestion that low GFR might be quite a good uh, criterion to select patients on. Um, <clears throat> and perhaps if the anemia is a little bit more severe. We not only uh, improved outcomes, I think, in the Ironman trial, but also helped to improve patients, uh, uh, make, help them feel better. This is the Minnesota Living with Heart Failure questionnaire, uh, which improves uh, significantly, especially if you looked at the physical domain, which is more to do with how much the patient can exert themselves, how much they feel they can do, as opposed to uh, whether they're um, depressed or anxious. So if we look more at the physical symptoms, a clearer benefit. And in terms of serious adverse events, um, nothing much happening here. There is a worry that uh, giving people more iron might increase the risk of infection, but we really didn't see that. Uh, so uh, and the uh, hospitalizations due to infection were reduced. Uh, an awful lot of those, of course, were uh, respiratory infections. So there are a number of intravenous irons available in the UK. Uh, the two most popular now are iron uh, derisomaltos and ferric carboxymaltos. Um, as I've shown you, I think they produce rather similar benefits. Um, and there is a feeling that uh, intravenous iron is basically, uh, it's a generic issue. So it's really more about safety. Uh, and uh, how large a dose you can give at a single sitting because then that improves the efficiency of the, uh, of the care. And you, basically you can give more iron derisomaltos than you can give for a ferric carboxymaltos in a single sitting. <clears throat> and the evidence suggests that they are similarly safe. So these are my conclusions. Are the benefits of intravenous iron generic or specific to ferric carboxymaltos? And I think we can say they're probably generic. Are these, uh, there are differences in the safety of intravenous irons. Uh, so we uh, can't say that all IV irons are generically safe. I think we have to look at specific agents. Uh, are ferric carboxymaltose and ferric derisomaltose similarly safe? Uh, I think the answer is yes, but maybe we can give higher doses of ferric derisomaltose. Uh, is it uh, in administration of IV iron effective in the non-acute setting? Uh, it seems to be similar in the acute to non-acute setting, but potentially you get more bang for your bucks if you take the non-acute, mildly symptomatic anemic patient, the NYHA2 patients. Um, should TSAT be the preferred diagnostic test for iron deficiency? I don't think we have conclusive evidence yet, but I think we have very strong pointers and I think most people are going in that direction. Uh, do we have evidence of longer term efficacy and safety? I think we do. Uh, do we have evidence that uh, IV iron reduces mortality? I think we've got some interesting trends, uh, but uh, um, I think we need more evidence. But I think we have uh, demonstrated the safety of intravenous iron. Uh, the trial evidence now excludes an important increase in mortality, although we can't conclusively say there is a reduction in mortality. There is another large trial that will report later this year, uh, and hopefully that will provide the conclusive evidence that we need. So thank you very much indeed. And I'm told I should leave you with this last uh, but not very readable slide. Thank you very much indeed.